All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Manverse Podcast. I am your host, Tom Traplin, and this is the show where we talk about building profitable and successful game businesses with a little bit of feedback in that. So that's cool, but I have with me my co-host and friend, John Coviello. Hey, everyone. How are you guys? John Coviello here from the Little Shop of Magic in Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah. What's it like down there right now? Uh, chilly. We're like in our 40s. So, you know, it's cold for us. We have jackets and boots and stuff on. So <laughs> what is 40 in Celsius? Uh, oh, God, I don't know. Probably not as cold as you guys get out there. So I yeah, 40... I'm looking at snow and ice outside. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> but for us, anything below 60 degrees is, is cold. 72 Fahrenheit is the perfect temperature, right? That's what it's supposed to be. Gotcha. Right. That's in Celsius. I guess I can... Ideal room temperature, right? Mm hmm okay well well it's nice nice to see you again it's been a little while it has been busy really really busy so uh that would be 4.4 degrees celsius google says so okay so not quite freezing not quite no. uh, you know you're gonna get snow you're gonna get ice but that's definitely like put your jacket on weather yeah, yeah. even for canadians i guess but other than that store's been busy um razzle frazzled uh just like keeping up with uh, we hired more people and, you know, I think 2019 is my year to try to detach a little and put in systems to where I'm not, I'm going to try working from home one day out of the week to see if that is feasible and we'll see where it goes from that's there. A, so That's a good goal. Yeah. I like that one. Yeah. A little bit of detachment is, is what I need because it's, uh, you know, I'm not going to say I'm turning a certain decade next year and yeah, it, I'm starting to feel it. So. Getting to the, the golden years, maybe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. But no, business is good overall. Um, we're up. Um, the holiday seasons have been so far a little disappointing. Um, not so much in store. We're up overall in store. Our, um, our online sales have been like significantly impacted for whatever reason. And we're going to probably discuss a lot of it later on in the episode. But uh, we've seen a huge dip in, in the Amazon channel. Um, like uh, things like 40% less units. And, no, sorry. About fifty percent less units, about forty percent less sales, with a spike in fulfilled by Amazon. So stuff that we fulfill here doesn't seem to really Move get bought, right? But stuff that we send to Amazon for them to fulfill is on a huge uprise. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk in the seller forums about like intentional, not intentional. They've done some upgrades, some modifications to SEO. Uh, search engine and opposite. Look, long story short, mm -hmm. conspiracy theories abound. I just look <laughs> at my comments and yes, my in-store Amazon fulfilled sales are down, but my the stuff that I send to them is like incredibly out. It was all in all, it's a positive year. Just if we would have done what we did last holiday season, this holiday season, um, in both channels, in-store and online, it would have been an incredible year. As it is, it's a pretty decent year. I think we're comping up about 16%. So I'm not complaining about that. It's just literally, we were looking at 25 to 30% if the holiday season kept up par on both channels. Right now, the in-store one is really good. The online one, not so much. So. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. So, well, it, it kind of leads us into what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to, this is going to be a bit of a state of the industry. Kind of, We're going to recap some of the stuff that's kind of happened in 2018, being this is we're recording this uh, December 12th. So we're nearing the end of the year. We're going to look back and see, what, uh, see what's happened, see what's uh, affected stores across North America, and, and uh, yeah, do a, a fun stroll down memory lane. So I guess that, that's a, a good place to start. Let's talk about Amazon. Okay. So Amazon recently, they got a $2 billion or $3 billion subsidy. I'm not exactly sure how many billions. A couple at least. A lot more than I ever, I ever see. Yeah. And they got that to, uh, to move their second headquarters to uh, Long Island, New York, apparently. So that combined with the fact that wizards and game retailers seem to be pushing online sales uh, quite hard in a, in a way that seems to be cutting out a lot of store owners. So what are we... What, let's talk about uh, what's going on with your Amazon sales in particular. And see so we, yeah, I mean, it's uh, like I said, it's um, it, we just noticed the starting. I want to say in September, they were like, man, this this we're just not seeing a lot of orders compared to like the previous year kind of situation. Mm -hmm. And we've been racking our brain trying to figure out are we doing something different. There there are some things in place like there's a lot more maps 
right? Uh, minimum advertised price policies, and that kind of levels the playing field. But it also means that, um, you know, you're not seeing that sell through because everybody's sitting at the same price. So therefore, you're not seeing the super mega discounts clearing out fast and they're out of product. And now people like me, that I'm not a, I'm not a fan of working more for less money, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I want to make sure that I have a living wage and I'm not going nuts trying to fulfill orders for pennies on the dollar. But what happens is if these people that are in the habit of just like, oh, I need to dump this, get it out, I don't care if it's pennies, if they don't run out of product, because it's all at 10% or 20% or whatever the map is set at, it's going to be a long time before the buy box comes to us, right? We're all on the same level and there's a million sellers and it's like, you get two minutes in the spotlight. Oh, didn't sell. This guy gets two minutes in the spotlight. Oh, we sold one yeah. to this guy, but yeah. So, so that's a possibility. The seller forms right now for Amazon, like the same, they're just ablaze with conspiracy theories and like, oh, they're shutting us out, et cetera, et cetera. What we have noticed is that um, we've done more with FBA because um, fundamentally there are some things that are a little bit harder for us to process, big boxes, heavy things. Um, they have a much more leverage with the shipping services, so it's easier, a little more costly, but in the end, it balances out because you would end up spending a ton of money on shipping versus if you do it through them, the shipping is lower, right, kind of situation. Um, so long story short, that's, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a, an increase in FBA orders and a decrease in regular fulfilled by store orders, um, you know, and for us, there's been some logistical nightmares of making sure that we abide by all the maps and, you know, run into problems um and we, we try but when oh what do we have give me just a second here let me go look right now um let's see here right now on um, amazon oh let me switch from canada to the u.s um sorry for pause we are showing twenty one thousand and seventy products right mm -hmm. so when you look at that there's a possibility that we make a mistake here or there, and then we get a nasty call from a supplier saying, hey, you violate a map, we've got to fix it. Most of them are understanding. Once I go, look, my catalog is pretty vast, and then, you know, if we miss something, but some of them are like, oh, 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 this is the second time, you know, kind of situation. Yeah. Um, now, this whole billion dollar thing, I didn't follow it, so what would it, the state of New York paid them money to move to New York? Is that what you're telling me? Well, it's a subsidy, right? So they didn't, well, they're not cutting up a $2 billion check, as far as I can tell. I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. But they're basically saying, you know, we'll give you a whole bunch of tax breaks, a whole bunch of cuts, you know, a, a gigantic number of incentives, right, to come to us. And I guess a lot of cities were competing for this, for Amazon to, to show up, right? With the basic idea that Amazon's supposed to bring in, what was it, 50,000 or something like that. And I got the... Uh, had the article up. That doesn't matter. Either way, they were supposed. They're basically saying that we're going to bring in a large number of jobs, and okay. these number, of, these jobs are all going to be high-paying executive kind of style jobs. So these people are going to be contributing a lot of taxes to the local economy. So therefore, your city should pay us a whole boatload of money because in the future you're going to get all of it back. That's the idea. We're going to hire people from your city, and it's going to be great. And you know, you're the uh, the head of the city council, and you'll be the one who brought in Amazon. That's kind of the, the pitch, right? But I guess the, there have been a lot of, uh, well, besides the fact that it's, it's interesting that Amazon's already so gigantic and then the government is giving up this massive handout that they would not even consider giving out to, uh, you know, any other smaller or local business. Like if they're gonna give out $2 billion to a gigantic corporation, maybe they consider putting that money into the local economy that already exists. Maybe they could use it better. Maybe they could, you know, it's directly going to stimulate that economy, not necessarily maybe stimulate the economy in the future by potentially hiring people. Uh, but I guess a lot of the, uh, I guess the conspiracy theories is that the promised jobs will not actually be drawn from the local economy either. Like they won't hire people from Long Island. They'll just bring people from the rest of Amazon and kind of, you know, like, okay, I'm not going to hire anybody. I'm going to just bring people from my existing organization and fill up this new HQ that we've got, maybe hire a tiny number of people. But it's not going to be what they promised. I guess that's part of the, uh, part of the disappointment that a lot of uh, people have. But in 
from the perspective of a store owner, Amazon is almost a direct competitor in a lot of ways. Like for you, you're, you are a partner in, in some ways, right? Like a lot of your business yeah. is on Amazon, right? So it's not that you can't take advantage of the platform, but if you are not, like say you're not necessarily selling on, online yet, if you're just a, a local brick and mortar shop, Amazon is a force to be reckoned with, right? Because sure. it's almost impossible to compete on price. Like you said uh, before, you were buying stuff off of Amazon because they were cheaper than you could get it from the distributor. Uh, yeah, there's been a couple of cases where product. like um, it, they've literally been better and I'm like, okay, well, this is crazy and I'm going to do what I can to get that, uh, that product, right? Why um, wouldn't you? Well, sure. Um, other than you're trying to keep a, a healthy retail chain, you're, at, a retail, you're trying to keep a healthy distribution chain and environment that, that Amazon price is not going to be there 24 seven, whatever they're doing right now to unload or cause don't get me wrong. They make mistakes like anybody else, right? If they're trying to get rid of a product, they're going to do what they can to get rid of it. Um, th there's also, I mean, this, this enamored, and I know people are, you get this thing, so mail order catalogs were supposed to kill retail. Um, uh, Shop by TV was supposed to kill retail. Now it's online. The reality is, my theory is that in the United States in general, we are over retail. There is definitely way more stores than can be supported. Right? And especially like these big chains like Toys R Us and Walmart. Uh, the reality is, they're not offering you anything different than going to Amazon and getting that product. There is, there is no quantifiable difference instant gratification maybe i mean honestly yeah. by the time i get around and go to this walmart that didn't have the l-shaped cable and then go to that walmart and the other one i finally found that i could just said you know what i'm gonna sit at home and get it i think what amazon is good at is removing the friction and conditioning people to go we are the cheapest when the reality is is not necessary not right? yeah. it, it really isn't if you do some shopping around you can find better deals but the reality is for me, if I ever shop on Amazon, it's because I can't find what I'm looking for in town or it's nigh impossible to get it or it's, a, you know what I mean? Fundamentally, there's not that much of a difference. And I know we put a lot of emphasis on online sales, but we still need to realize. So last year, 13% of the entire sales in the United States, and I don't know about Canada, but was online sales. Mm -hmm. The other 87% is still going through brick and mortar, right? So it's still a lot of, the, so the fact that these states are so enamored with bringing Amazon as this darling child that's going to provide all these jobs. I don't know how well guided that is. I'm not a politician, but I'll tell you what, it seems to appease a lot of people and it seems to kind of look like a little trophy to go, look what I did. I brought Amazon to, to, you know, the state, I guess time will tell if it's going to work out for them or not. And so we were talking about a little bit about the minimum wage thing, right? And we were talking about like, they're yeah, pushing yeah. for fifteen dollars. I don't remember what the minimum wage in New York is. I guarantee you, it's more than fifteen dollars. I, because you're not gonna do anything with fifteen dollars an hour in New York City. In New York, nothing. <laughs> like, you're gonna be eating peanuts, basically, kind of situation. Um, you know, so it's all a matter of perspective of that minimum wage that they're promising uh, where you are, right? So if they moved it to there, uh, I'm not gonna be impressed. Okay. Uh, it says here as of December 31st, 2016, $9 and 70 hours. And they're already raising it each year until they reach $15 an hour. So they're going to get to that 15 thing. I don't know how great that is here in Vegas. $15 an hour is like pretty handsome. You know what I mean? Um, well, the, um, that's, that's the second, uh, difficulty that I guess, you know, that's all retail. It's not it's every single business is facing this, but, you know, game stores generally occupy the, the lower end of the retail spectrum. And generally, retail jobs don't pay a huge amount of money. And right. so minimum wage was kind of where they kind of sat around. But rising labor costs, they, you know, that's going to be an upward pressure that's going to be uh, difficult for a lot of game store owners to overcome. And as well, what we were saying before was that uh, part of the, the interesting you know, again, conspiracy theory thing is that Amazon originally pushed back against the $15 minimum wage movement sure. that like started in Seattle and then kind of spread around the country. But then I guess they sort of realized that, hey, this might actually be a, a good move. And they flipped their position around and they said, okay, let's do the $15. Like I, I vow to make every, you know, Amazon worker uh, earn at least $15 an hour. I'll pay them that much. 
but then I'm going to lobby, you know, me being Jeff Bezos, I'm going to lobby for the government to institute that as like a federal rule across the land. Everyone, every business will now have to pay their workers $15 an hour at least, right? Now that's just the beginning of, you know, 10 years in the future, that's going to be, it's going to keep going up. Why would they stop, right? Sure. But this is going to naturally put pressure on other retailers, other game stores. Now, that's going to be something that they're going to have to figure out in the near future because labor is already kind of difficult for a lot of store owners to manage, right? Sure. Um, so I've got a number of, of perspectives coming from a game store um, environment specifically. So we have this, let's talk about an MSRP for a second, right? Manufacturer suggested retail price. And it's this, this nebulous, okay, we think we being, let's, let's pick on SEMA. We think this game should sell for $50. It's suggested. I can sell it at 60 if I want. Nobody's going to stop me from selling at 60. I don't know how many copies I will sell of a game that's MSRP at 50, and I'm trying to sell it at 60, right? So if I put myself in the shoes of somebody like, uh, I mean, you, you've interviewed Gary before from Black Diamond Games, right, I believe? Yeah. So he's wrote a book. By the way, I'm going to plug his book real quick. If you guys are ever thinking about opening up a game store, listen to this podcast, and then also go buy Gary's book because both are good, great tools. But so he's in San Francisco. Okay, and when he sells a fifty-dollar board game, let's pretend like he's getting a great margin. In this industry, if we can get fifty percent margin, we're we're happy. We're like, ooh, we paid twenty-five dollars for this item, we sold it for fifty. Let's assume you sell it for fifty, you didn't discount it at all, which is bad. But let's just let's go. So you made twenty-five bucks. Now, if Gary makes twenty-five bucks, and if I make twenty-five bucks, I pay X amount per square foot. He pays double or triple that amount per square foot. His expenses are considerably higher than mine. It's still the same $25. It's just that mine go way, way longer than his do. So he's got an inherent problem there. Now you add the increase in minimum wage, which, you know, people argue, well, it's California. People need more money to pay rent and all that. I get that. But he has to pay his employees $15 an hour. And it doesn't go as far for his employees because of the environment they're in. On the other hand, for me, if I'm paying my employees $12 an hour, it goes a lot farther than their 15, right? So this is an inherent advantage that some states, some counties, some localities have. Um, for sure. Minimum wage kind of thing, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to work. My other problem with the minimum wage thing, go ahead, yeah. As you're saying, it should not be a flat thing. It shouldn't be just like everyone gets the same because not every environment is the same. Like you're saying that uh, like the cost of living in one city can be three times higher, four times higher, depending on which city you're talking about than it is somewhere else. And it doesn't make sense for you to mandate certain things that have to be identical because the cities are not the same. Sure. So in, in minimum wage, it's just one of those things that each, like it should be very localized if you're going to do that. Rather than and my other problem that I have as a business owner about the minimum wage, I really struggle with finding qualified, competent workers. Now, if you're telling me that at the base level, I have to pay somebody $15 an hour to flip burgers, press the button on the fryer, or mop my floor, what should I pay my business manager who makes the schedule, who makes sure that we order the right product? right? I mean, I can't scale her at the same level that I just went from somebody. It's like minimum wage is seven seventy five. I doubled it to 15, right? What do I do with the store manager now? I double her salary. It's fair, right? I mean, she's doing way more. And, and you can't. You, that, that breaks down. So now I have this leveling of like, literally, I'm paying my managers the same amount as I'm paying my base employees. I'm probably going to end up having to demand more from my managers and keep them what they're getting paid and not hire a new person right so there's arguments back and forth about this minimum wage and and you were saying that one of the arguments that because why why amazon wants it now is because we can absorb that hit and all our competitors can't right you know it's a insurance bill, right? they say well you know we've got the power we've got the funds we can last potentially years at this rate without really taking a big hit to the margin. We can make things work. Maybe we'll get some, some declines in the next couple of years, but as long as we can survive, we'll knock out a whole pile of other competitors who won't be able to manage that. Right. And it's like, theoretically imagine if you could, if you had like, I guess a thought experiment would be like, what if you had a million bucks, you know, set aside in your war chest as your business, you're a local game store owner and you have the ability to say, 
we're going to raise the minimum wage on all the other stores in my region and we're going to pay everybody a hundred bucks an hour. Just that's the minimum. You can't do it for less, you know, including yourself as the owner. You're not allowed to pay yourself less than a hundred bucks an hour. How many of your you know, competitors are going to be able to stay open at all, right? Probably zero. Virtually no way is going to be able to do that for any length of time. And you just say, okay, that's fine. I can do that for a little while. And then maybe I can make this math work now that all of my competitors are gone. hundred bucks is probably a bit, of an, uh, a bit of an exaggeration. You probably wouldn't be able to do that for very long. But, but that's kind of the idea that Amazon can can endure this. And a lot of stores, a lot of retailers are not going to be able to maintain this for, for long, or they're going to have to shrink drastically, or they'll just, you know, just exit. Like, why would you, if you eliminate the reason to do business by like taking away someone's sure. profit margin, what's the point of being in business? And that's kind of, kind of the point, right? Like you've got your overhead and then you got your minimum wage and like what you get in the middle is just kind of get squeezed and squeezed. And that's just one of the things, one of the, environmental pressures that uh you know especially retailers have to deal with right now yeah somebody sent me a quote uh, just just today that uh, i forget who it was i wish i could credit them but uh, hopefully i'll next show I, I can get it but sure. the quote was that basically a successful business does not generate revenue it generates profit right so at the end of the day if you're a two billion dollar store a year and it takes you 2.1 billion dollars to make that two billion dollars you're not a successful business right yep. um but going back to that MSRP, so the, the thought being that, okay, so if we raise minimum wage, people have more money. And if they have more money, they're going to spend it on more things. Maybe. Theoretical. Am I going to see more people buying more board games? Because that's what I need. McDonald's could potentially go, hey, look, I got to pay my, my fryer guy $15 an hour. So the value meal is gone now from $1 to $2. Okay. Fix. You want you want a burger? That's what it costs, right? Because we got to pay the employee. If my publisher doesn't go, huh? I have to pay because what they're what what we've been seeing, and I don't want to fault the publishers, but I've gotten this response a couple of times that it's like, well, John, we can't raise the MSRP on this game because people already complain about fifty dollars, but we gotta we gotta pay our employee more or or cost of freight or the tariffs or all this stuff have gone up. So what we're doing is cutting your discount. Okay, that's, that's great, right? So I'm expected to pay more money to my employees while operating at a narrower margin because I can't raise that price to $60 when it's a $50. So they're asking you to pay their employees too. And I get it. I, I sympathize. But in the end of the day, if I can't make this work, like the numbers aren't there, my solution is, frankly, you know, I have a pretty good nest egg. I close the doors and I go, it was nice. Well, also, this has been 25 years. Have a nice life. Bye, guys. You know, and, that, and that, so that's so that weird sort of daisy chain that the publisher wants to avoid because as much as there's talk about we don't need the retailers, we don't, and there's some credit to that. There's some bad retailers that people get bad experiences with, right? But in general, it's a knowledge that as a publisher, you want to have a healthy environment where people can discover games can play the games, can make friends who play games, right? So that's the reason why maintaining this ecosystem is, is still important, regardless of what the naysayers say. Uh, I don't think we're at the point yet where we can flip a switch and go, look, everything is Kickstarter. We don't need to do anything else but that, and we're all happy and go lucky. It, it doesn't quite work that way. Not yet. I don't know if I ever will. Right? Uh, we're pretty social when we play board games, when we play card games. We need to find new people, and the way you find them in general is these community hub hubs that happen to be retail stores too. So. Uh, so it, it's a challenge. It's going to sound biased because it's coming from somebody who has to cut a check every two weeks, right? Yep. But I listen to economists. I listen to a lot of other people. And it's a very debated argument whether raising the minimum wage is, is – I'm a big fan of, like, I want the government out of my wallet and out of my bedroom, right? So at the end of the day, don't dictate to people – what they should get paid if they're qualified, man. If I can find a good applicant, I will do my very best to pay that person more. You don't have to tell me this is the minimum. Because honestly, if I am way below the pay scale, I'm not going to get employees. Any smart employees is going to go, well, you know what, John, I love you, but you don't pay me enough. This guy does. They're going to go somewhere else. The need for minimum wage, I get it. There was this, this time where, hey, Take it or leave it. And potentially it's still there. But realistically speaking, you are in an opportunity to seek another job if you want to, right? 
my problem with the minimum is just literally it's a government mandate that you go okay well this is not it's it's such a broad scope thing that doesn't work for everybody and for some companies when you like amazon it's great for other companies like well i guess i'm cutting two employees or i'm shutting the doors you know which may be what they're after again sure. conspiracy so theories about who you're uh, who you're talking to who's sure. proposing a higher minimum wage but i i think part of it is just it's it's really hard to grasp all the implications of something like that. It's such a big lever in the economy, right? To, to do that, to increase that kind of thing, to see what the effects would be. So most people, you know, most people don't have an agree in economics and can't say, oh, this is what the, the supply and demand curve looks like. And this is what this is going to, you know, you can't map that out. You're just kind of like, oh, it sounds really good. Let's pay people who make the least amount of money in society more money. That seems like a good idea, right? So you get the feel goods. And I think that's, it's really, I think it's, I think the minimum wage argument is just too emotional for most people. Sure. And I'm sure I'm emotional about it too. Cause you know, I have my uh, beliefs about certain things yeah. as does everybody. But it, I like to, when I was uh, supervising a distribution warehouse, we were uh, like this is a long time ago when we started, I believe the minimum wage in my area was uh, something like 10 50 or 10 bucks, I think that's what it was. And we were hiring workers for 12. And this was just a, a distribution, you know, a sure. big empty warehouse, big warehouse, right? And we were hiring people for that. And it was fine for the first little while. But then as minimum wage started to creep up, and, you know, it's not quite at 15. I don't think there's a real push for it to become $15 in Canada, at least not yet. But it, it's been escalating. And it went from uh, 1050 to 11 to 1150 in like a relatively short order time. And it got to the point where it was, I think, a quarter behind what we were hiring people for. And it was at the point, like, the job was brutal. Like, we're talking hard labor, you know, uh, ripping freight off a truck all yeah. day, hot, cold, just not nice. So we had this, we had a problem where we could not hire anybody for a good six months. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't. And we're talking, it was the, the total uh, labor pool of people we had was about 35 at the max. So when we could not hire anybody, that was a big problem because all of a sudden the, the attrition was a major issue, right? We, we had to fight to get the baseline hiring to be at least a dollar higher than that. We started going to 13. And I think when I ended up leaving, uh, I believe we were hiring people for 14 bucks an hour and okay. minimum wage was only a dollar behind. And it started, like, it's just, a, it's a constant race. But there was this uh, endless frustration from guys who'd been there for five years, right? Because when you're, you're working a job like that, usually you're getting probably 2% a year raise. Yeah. So they're guys who've been there for five years, you know, trying to put in their time, loyalty, all that stuff. And they're making pretty much the exact same as just the random guy picked up off the street. And there's yeah. just, and then you get this resentment of like, I've been here forever. I know I'm much more experienced and better trained than you. And you get paid as much as me. Awesome. So it's like you were saying with the manager, right? Like the minimum wage goes up, but you, not everyone's wage goes up according like to that. This, this leveling of like, well, then at that point, I just want to be the fry cook. I don't, I don't, yeah. I'm going to get the same amount of money. I might as well just press a button and flip the fries when I need. Well, take the fries out of the basket when I need to and I'm done. Right? I don't have to deal with. Yeah, yeah you don't need all the responsibility if you're going to get paid as much as everyone else. There's no reason to, to achieve it. It's, 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 there's a lot of issues with it besides the fact that it, it like reduces profit margin in general, right? Yeah, and I, and I don't pretend to be an economist. Like I said, I listen to a lot of them and I, I, it's a fascinating subject to me. But even for people that have degrees and have been in positions of dictating policy, it's, an, it's a heated argument because there is no real, like, it's almost like, is there a God, right? I mean, it, yeah. it's, there's so many ramifications to these decisions that it's hard to, and with data, as much as it is data, I can read you data and interpret two different things, right? To make it the way I want it to. It's, it's easy to read into things. And when it's this complex and this, you know, is it this yeah, policy that affected it? Is this it's variable, not this variable. And all of a sudden the, the graph is completely different. And hey, I proved my point perfectly. Sure. I mean, one way to make sure that there's less poor people in America is you just, you know, lower the poverty rate, right? And all of a sudden, if you're making $10,000 a year and it's not poverty, poverty is 8,000, there's less yeah. poor people. Less poor people. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> Job accomplished. Yeah. Yes, so uh, eh. anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. And I'm sure we're probably gonna get a lot of pushback on that, but I might be. 
<laughs> I hope we do. I hope you, we do. you would be surprised. Um, I'm always a fan of like, I, I, I base everything on like, uh, you know, okay, we want to raise minimum wage. Where's the money coming from? Because the other, the other side effect theoretically about minimum wage going up is costs go up, right? I mean, everybody's dollar burger is now $2. Yeah. It, it, that's sort of inevitable in my opinion, right? I mean, it's going to happen. And I'm, I'm not sure about this whole rising tide floats all boats, man. If you got holes in that boat, it's going down. You know? so, um, That's a good way to put it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. and I'm also not like, unlike some of these people that I saw like anti-Amazon. I mean, I, I'm sort of envisioning a future where honestly, and I think this is already there. There is really no substantial difference between online sales, in-store sales. We're moving toward as an integrated society, right? I mean, I... If I look at things like we do our singles through TCG Player Pro, one of the greatest functions that I can have from that system is the ability for somebody to place their order from home and have it ready for pickup here when they come play Friday Night Magic, right? I mean, is that an internet sale? Is that an in-store sale? I don't freaking care, man. It's a customer. I need to be where they are, right? And and however they're going to want to buy it, I'm going to sell it to them, right? And, and again, I'm not proposing that you should slash prices and all this good stuff, you know? I mean, just customer acquisition is important. And right now, there's a variety of ways to acquire this customer. There are social posts on Facebook, a listing on Amazon. I, it, they're all important, and I don't want to be shut off from any of them. And that's different than not trying to preserve a value proposition of that product, making sure you don't slash it down to nothing so nobody can make any living on it, you know, kind of situation. That's that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the ability to be able to expose this product to as many channels as possible and my store by consequence. Yeah, there's no reason not to take advantage of the channel, especially once you've like mastered the ones that you've got set up already. You know, start, start working on others. There's no reason to turn away business, right? Sure. But I think the... the uh, unless Unless your resources, because I don't advocate this for everybody, right? If your resources are limited, stick to what you're doing well. When your resources expand, start looking at other things you can do. I mean, idle hands are the devil's work, right? So definitely, if you find yourself like, man, I've been spending a whole week building magic decks. Maybe you should be doing something else too. You know what I mean? So. But that, that's what I mean by like, focus on what you're good at, master right. the one channel. And they're like, okay, I've got this, it works, the sales process works, generating business. Okay, now let's look at something else and then, sure. you know, figure out how to make that work and then figure out how the math works. And then, okay, now that's working. Now move on to the next one. There's no reason to, to not do that. I think the issue, and this leads into the, uh, the second or the third point is that it's, it's like they're favoring certain parties over others. Sure. Right. So it, that's kind of, I think the, the issue. So like the, let's just talk about the, the loss of direct from wizards. That was okay. a big one, right? So when, mm -hmm. uh, October 31st was when it went into effect. Wizards was no longer uh, kind of acting as a distributor in a sense from themselves, right? And this put all of the, uh, all the supply chain went to all the various distributors, was, which gives them a lot of power, right? Well, it gives them a lot of, uh, well, it, it, it puts a lot of emphasis on how good of a relationship you have with your distributor in the first place. I'm going to agree. It also opens up competition among distributors, right? True. You now don't have... A specific bar oh we need to come as close as possible to the wizards price because that's what everybody is using right yeah. now it's like hey i can af so so there's a little bit of that open market there where it materializes or not i don't know right there's a lot of it right now it's like okay so how good of a customer are you of mine that determines your price right yeah which is also fair yeah no there was there's also some concerns that uh like i guess some of the uh I don't know how widespread it was or which distributors or where it happened, but there was concern that uh, certain distributors were hoarding product in an effort to uh, boost the, the, like kind of create an artificial scarcity to increase the price. And like, that's like the, you know, the master sets and things like that, just hold back some of that product. And as long as everyone kind of agrees to say, okay, we're just going to keep some of this back. Like the, the supply is naturally going to be suppressed. Right. And with wizards shipping direct always, feeding out a certain amount of product at a certain price. And that was just the way they were doing it. It kind of prevented that from really happening. But now without that uh, kind of that uh, valve of product constantly going out into the market, it kind of opens the doors for distributors to do this. Not that I'm accusing anybody of uh, necessarily well, doing it, but it is a possibility. Sure. And I mean, and honestly, the whole, uh, nobody's going to come out and tell you what their allocation process is. Right. I mean, I, it's a, if I look at me when I'm dealt with, um, 
limited product, right? I have X amount of customers I need to fulfill. I got Y amount of customers that don't give me the time of day except when they're looking something from me, you know? Um, and I got the occasional new customer that's really kind of looking for this and I could win somebody, right? How do I determine how much do I give to this? How much do I give to that, right? So I try to be as fair as possible. If you're a distributor, and again, you're right. I don't want to accuse anybody of anything, but there's nothing to stop you from going, you know what? These 100 boxes, we're going to toss them on eBay, okay? And make direct sales that way. Because you could. I mean, there's nothing really to stop you. There's a little bit of a, like, it's implied that as a distributor, you're not going to do that. But let's be realistic. They make mistakes like we do. They get stuck with their product. It's an outlet, right, to get rid of it um, kind mm -hmm. of situation. Uh, what are all of them engage in it? Some of them engage in it. Some of them have direct to the public web stores, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's a case of some people that own a distribution company and own a retail store. You know, I mean, it's, it's so intermingled and it's difficult to, um, but yeah, the only thing I can say about allocations is you stand a better chance to get what you want when you develop a relationship with a distributor. Mm -hmm. if, if your focus was magic and your entire distribution channel consisted of wizards, it feels like a slap in the face. I get it. Because there went your supply. Now you got to spend time building these relationships. And it's a painful process because now everybody else that was doing that like you is doing the same thing. And you're all competing for, let's just say everything is on the up and up. And GTS, ACD, they each got a thousand copies of Journal Master. They got a thousand boxes. That's it. They got to decide who to give it to, right? Yep. I might get a little bit better pricing because I give them an extra $5,000 worth of merchandise in that order. It's not just magic. You might not be in that situation because you specialize in magic and that's great. That's awesome. But that's your whole product line. You're not interested in their cheaties. You're not interested in their about uh, war games. You know, I mean, it's all this stuff that you look at it at the end of the day and put yourself in their shoes, right? If a customer mm -hmm. walked into your store and it's the customer that's always giving you money, um, and then a customer walks in and you never saw him before, or even worse, you see him only when there's a master set coming out looking for more masters, right? Who do you give it to and what do you do? So the best thing I can, the best advice I can offer to stores like that is you got to grin and bear it and either start diversifying or understand that's part of the process now. Magic is a much more difficult environment to sort of, but to me, it's always felt that way for the last almost eight years. It's becoming a less and less of a, revenue generator right i mean uh, the, the profit is just not sorry not revenue profit generator it just really isn't there um there's expectations on the client and they really are hard if not silly to meet right kind of situation and then i don't know I, I, diversify for sure i've seen some crazy diversifications there are people doing iphone repairs um uh, yeah. uh, e-cigs you know hey whatever it takes to you look at your market and you go this is underserved and you want to do it and you're good at it right I'm, i don't do iphone repair and i'm not gonna freaking open up those things and try to figure it out right yeah mm -hmm. but i've known some people that like to tinker with that stuff and they do well with it awesome man if it keeps your doors open and that's what you want to do do it you know so by complaining about wizards closing it down we can complain all we want but if that was the right decision in their book look i don't know how much money that costs and to be honest with you, they were not my best source. I had stopped ordering direct from them for pre-releases because twice, twice, they failed to get me the product that I needed for launch or pre-release. I forgot which one it was, but it's, and it's catastrophic because their solution is like, well, we can't, as soon as we can get it to you is Monday or Tuesday. What the heck am I going to do with that when the pre-release was Friday night, Saturday morning? Right? What am I going to do with that? Yeah. <laughs> my sales are gone. My, my customers, as much as they love me, they go, oh, you don't have the packs, man. Sorry. See ya. Yeah, I'm going to go to the next shop. So, so, you know, that was the beginning of my relationship with GTS. They overnighted me at their expense, this stuff. And I was able to save the pre-release because of that. Wizards didn't have those systems. They had no way. They closed down at four or whatever. Now there's nobody in the warehouse, even if they wanted to. <laughs> at my expense, they're, they, they, don't, they don't have the system to do that, right? So I, I never considered them a great supplier when there was damages. And again, I don't want to bag on them because it's just like a third <laughs> publisher, right? But there were damages. The system was, okay, send us back the product. We'll send you a random product to compensate. It was always more stuff. 
like monetary value, but I would send back Betrayal in the House on the Hill. I need that back. I get two boxes of magic. But I need a Betrayal. <laughs> That's the copies of that I order, you know? Yeah. So yeah, there were issues with Wizards too, and I'm not trying to bag on them. I, I really feel like, as a publisher goes, they do do a lot of stuff to try to help out and be the publisher. And then, you know, I mean, the promos, the the, the cool Hell Vault promotions, all, all these the posters, the banners, right? This is all stuff that costs money and they do it. It's to promote their brand. Don't get me wrong. There's a self-serving thing there. But they're not 100% going, man, screw you retailer, right? At the end of the day, if I look at costs and they go, well, it's time to cut this, right? And I don't know how much pressure comes from parent company saying stockholders not happy. It's not been a great year for the U.S. stock market. Right? Hasbro has been bleh. Uh, Amazon is actually bleh. <laughs> I lost a couple hundred dollars because I bought some Amazon stock and then it, now I'm back up and I bought a whole bunch of, and then went back up. But anyways, long story short, I mean, Amazon stock's not doing great, right? So at the end of the day, they have shareholders to account to. And when you sit in an office and you're counting beans, man, it's just another bean that may not make sense to them. Why are we doing this? So if they decide to cut it out, it's painful to everybody in our situation, but yeah, c'est la vie, man. Learn to adapt to the world the way it is. Uh, Put as many buffers in place so you don't rely on one source. That <laughs> goes without saying, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, the old uh, don't put your all, all your eggs in one basket certainly applies here. So moral of the story is uh, build a better relationship with your distributor. And Yeah, no better time than the present, man. Just start, start, and, and, and accept the fact that you may be low on the plutonium pole. You're just, you got to start somewhere, right? And if you, you never climbed, you got to start at the bottom. So, yeah, yeah. So the next stop was uh, counterfeits from China. So again, we did a, an episode a while ago about uh, mm-hmm. the issue of counterfeits in general, but the train has not stopped. The, the, the quality of a counterfeit has continued to rise. Mm-hmm. So the idea the, the question of, you know, what makes a legitimate magic card and, you know, identifying the fakes has become more and more uh, costly, right? Sure. Like you need to be almost an export, an expert with a jeweler's loop to be able to, to see some of these differences, right? They've even got to the point where they can like reliably replicate almost the foiling process as well as the, the like the hologram on the newer cards. I don't know what to say about that other than it kind of sucks. Sure. I, so we don't do a huge amount of singles or deal with singles, but even us, we've now started to basically, we have a training program to where we have to make sure that our employees know how to spot at least some of the more common types of fakes and stuff like that. And yeah, you're right. We need a jeweler's monocle, whatever the heck those things are called yeah. to actually see some of these things. We've, I mean, we have times where we shut off the lights and just to make, do the main light on top to get it against the light and see the, the transparency. I mean, it's some crazy stuff, but, um, it goes further than that, and it's particularly troublesome because magic values are based on scarcity, right? Yep. So if you have a whole bunch of cards entering the market, and if they're good enough to pass as real, I mean, people are like, oh, ban that person. Like, but like, if somebody comes in with a fake $20 bill, did he sit there in the printing press in the bottom of his basement, right? I mean, yeah, yeah legitimately. You can buy fakes and you buy, you can just go and buy what they call proxies, right? And then try to pass them off as genuine. So there are those people who do that. But I would imagine that a lot of people might get duped themselves and not realize and then just go, well, I don't want this card anymore. I'm going to go sell it to John. You know what I mean? Kind of situation. Yeah. Like that, um, I think what's probably happening is that if there are those bad actors who are like, okay, I'm going to go buy a whole pile of, of proxy cards. They're not going to the shops and saying, hey, I want to dump some of these cards, you know, give me some money. They're going to like other players and they're going to be like, hey, I want to trade some cards. You know, let's go, I'll trade this, you know, Tarmogoy for your Lillian of the Veil. Yep. Oh, I know I'm losing some value on this. I'm, I'm being a nice guy, whatever, right? So, and then that, those cards just start to disseminate through the local economy because they're good enough to pass for most people. Like, unless they're obviously like too rough, right? Especially when you're talking about the lower end cards right so cards that are under 20 bucks no one's giving them like a too close of an eye right because you're not gonna you don't really yeah. care you're shipping thousands of dollars of cardboard over the the table you probably look a little bit closer but yeah you know, for the smaller end stuff it just starts to disseminate right and then 
yeah, you get to that situation where these people are just like, oh, I'm going to trade in some of these cards to go play in this tournament or whatever. And if you find out that, uh, well, this one's not real. This one's also not real. Like yeah. You got duped at some point down the line. You traded with somebody who either was duped themselves. Again, how do you know, right? Yeah. Who the, uh, the bad actor in the chain was. Well, it's the same effect. Why would you bother counterfeiting a $20 bill? People don't look at a $20 bill as closely as they do a $100 bill, right? So, I mean, it's a little easier to slip it under the radar. Um, yeah, it, it, solutions to that, God, I mean, better counterfeiting um, systems, but it, it's, it's this race. It's a constant race, right? And, yeah. um, you know, I mean... <laughs> We're going to talk about tariffs, I believe, later on, too, um, kind of situation. But I, there is a big offender in, in that continent. China is a source of these. Um, they have the technology, the printing capabilities. And so a lot of this stuff enters through there. And it's now we're talking about trying to reach outside our borders, outside our laws, and get somebody to do something we want them to do, right? So it's difficult. I know... Um, a little bit more on the board gaming side, but I think they, they try to do it for everything. Like the Game Manufacturers Association has sent representatives. Stefan, the, the president, went. Um, and uh, so to talk to the, I've got um, the Border Patrol, basically. I forgot what that is. But basically to try to educate their agents on how to spot this stuff and all that good stuff. But the reality is, though, they got, they're worried about drugs, firearms entering the country. So they listen and they're going to do everything they can. It's on the grossness, grand, grand scope of things, not something that's like high profile, right? I mean, it's a, you're stopping yeah, yeah. hundreds of kilos of cocaine from entering the country or like illegal firearms and all that good stuff is one thing. And, and worrying about board games, you kind of go and go, okay, great, I'm sorry, I feel sorry for you, but you know, we'll do what we can in the situation. So yeah, because the problem extends to board games too, which are harder to counterfeit in some aspects, unless they're like card-based board games, like maybe Cards Against Humanity, that's relatively easy to do, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it is growing, and I don't know because I'm not a publisher. I don't have the numbers. I know, I know there's a lot of fear among it, and there's a lot of talk about like extinction level event as far as these counterfeiting becoming that prevalent and stuff like that. I don't know. I don't know. I know that some of the countermeasures they're putting in place are a little irrational in my opinion. It's sort of like, I almost feel like we're taking a step back to when GW was like, no, no online sales for anybody but us. Right? <laughs> I'm glad it took them it took him a while. I'm glad they, they sort of got back. I got to tell you, nobody's doing better in GW in my store right now. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible what they're doing for sales, right? And it's, it's part of it is online, part of it is in store, but in general, it's a strong 8th edition. I worry sometimes that fear causes some knee-jerk reactions that aren't the best possible solution, right? You invest so much time and so much effort into okay, I'm going to shut down Amazon sales because that's where the problem is. Or I'm going to put a sticker on it. Now we have these um, Renegade. I started noticing these transparency QR codes where you scan the box and it tells you where it was boxed and where it traveled to, right? So you can have a better idea. Is this a genuine product? It's interesting. I haven't explored it yet. So it's cool. I just don't know if all these resources are really – all this tying up of resources is really uh, um, a direct impact of like, we are seeing a huge crunch and it's because of counterfeiting or it's because in general, both with magic, because I gotta admit, I don't know for my store, magic isn't, it's crested and it's kind of been eh for a long time. Right? Right. We're nowhere near the, the heights of 10 years ago kind of situation. Um, and we're seeing that a little bit with board games now. So I don't know if there's this impression that, ooh, we're not selling that much, and I've talked to a couple of publishers. In general, I'm getting the trend that their sales are down this year compared to the previous year, and it must be because of counterfeiting, right? I don't know if there's, there's this fear that's like it couldn't be other causes. It's counterfeiting that's causing a loss in sales. Mm -hmm. I think there's there might be some of that, but there's also a lot of like there's a lot of board games out there. There's a lot of people that have entered that market. There's a lot being manufactured, right? So one thing I noticed about my sales this year in board games specifically, I don't have a runaway hit. Um, two years ago, right off the bat, I think in opening weekend, I sold 72 copies of Rebellion. It's a $100 board game, right? I don't have that this year. I don't have a title that I go, this is going to go in the hundreds of sales, right? I mean, I don't see that. So it feels like everything has been sort of 
spread out across multiple games and in general there's been less buying is it because we haven't brought in enough new blood and the blood that's here right now is like man i got a library full of games i'm good for a while and i only buy one game every six months because it's got to really grab me right i got all these other games i can play that i only play once every year so i want to slow down you know there could be a number of things i do know that it's much tougher for them because before you had to have a good game then it became you had to have a good game and good quality components then it became you had to have good game good quality components and a good rule book and maybe some video on how to play it. And then it became you got to have all those things. Now you better slap a hot IP on it like Fallout or Star Wars. Otherwise, you won't get noticed. Right? It seems like even the strong licenses nowadays are fighting to try to get some kind of um, it's notice. Yeah, it's a red so, uh, Yeah, it's 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 crazy, but that that's where we are, right? And I, and I feel bad for them because now they're just scrambling all like, What's the cause? What's the cause? Okay, I think it's a variety of causes. And I think also a lot of this is out of your control. I mean, more than making a great game, trying to market as best as possible, giving in a good IP, making sure there's a good component, more than doing all those things, I don't know what else you can do. I and mean, this might be just a tough time to be a publisher. You know what I mean? Just like for years, it's always been and still is a tough time to be a game retailer because no matter what, you have competition everywhere. Amazon, and we talk about Amazon, right? But what the publisher don't see, because it's like, oh, we're going to fix the prices on Amazon. Okay, great. What did you do about the guy next door to me who seems to believe that 30%, 40% off every day is a good idea? <laughs> I'm advertise that. But every time you walk in his store, there's a sign that says 40% off every day. He's not breaking any maps. He's not, but he's still, it's still a problem for me, you know? So, yeah. I just think some of these problems are not kind of starting to shift up to, like, not restocking from distribution chain and getting it from Amazon because it's cheaper. And I went to the distribution chain as a problem. And now it's reaching all the way to the publisher level where they're just not selling as much as they were before and kind of panicking a little bit about it. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the industry is a bit of a glacier. Really slow moving, takes some time. There's a lot of layers to it. But like it's, it feels like there's almost nothing, or at least, you know, I don't want to say that you're powerless to do anything about it, but it feels like there's massive forces that are affecting things. And as an individual business, you can't really do much other than just try and weather the storm. Sure. But see, together, like one of my solutions is honestly, man, we need to focus more on community outreach and building new blood, right? I mean, that's the thing. They, yeah. we, we put in maps, we, black, we block Amazon, we do all these crazy things, but I don't see a lot of like, hey, man, what do we do to generate a thousand new customers, 10,000, 100,000? Because there's a sea of mundanes out there that don't know what it is that we do. I mean, still get people walk up here thinking it's a magic rabbit in the hat store or they're like board games or like, you know, Monopoly, you know, so there's a whole sea of people out there that were, we got lucky and it was a perfect storm of like the resurgence of the board game and magic being hot and going digital and with the um, arena of the planeswalkers and all that kind of stuff, bringing in new blood in through different channels. I just don't feel like we're exploiting that enough and we can concentrate and do more on that and definitely yep. bring more people into the fold. Um, I mean, that, to me, that's very actionable. And one of the strategies we should be looking at. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. I was actually going to uh, record an episode to that effect and break down the math on why you absolutely need to focus on reaching new people, not just talking to the people who already know who you are. Just because the like mathematically, it doesn't work. You you have to. You can't build a business. You can't support a business just on the customers who know uh, who you are. You need to constantly find new people and constantly be growing. And uh, I feel like we might be in the dip right now of, of this like constant wave. And I feel like uh, at least with magic, what I always saw was there was like a big popularity wave. It was hot, hot, and then yeah. like it would kind of plateau for a little while. And it may not necessarily have anything to do with uh, crappy standard format or bad sets or baddings, but it probably does have something to do with that. And then like you know, popularity declines. And then a lot of those people out of that wave just kind of like phase out. They don't really come back. But then a whole wave of new people discover the game and it goes right back up again. And I think we're on the other side of the curve because I've seen several ups and downs of this like just a huge like uh, a new generation of people yeah. discover the game. Like, oh, this is a lot of fun. I should play this and spend a lot of money on this. And then they kind of move on to another stage of life. And then another generation comes up. 
And it's like every five years or something that there's this wave of people and there's a natural decline and there's a natural incline. But I think right now we're going back down. And I think part of it is you have to, you can, it doesn't happen naturally. Like I'm sure some of it does. Some people will say, hey, I used to play Magic. You should try it. You know, sure. it's a game I played 10 years ago or whatever. You should give it a shot. Maybe it's still out there and they come back. But if you don't go out there and find them, you don't let them know, you know, what's out there, what's, what kind of board games are, exist beyond the, the standard Monopoly and Scrabble and stuff like that. If you don't find those new customers, it's not going to happen. And it's, it, so the beauty of that too is it's something that we, especially game store retailers, can do very well. Target, Walmart, Amazon won't. They, yeah, they don't care. No, they're just, so there's a little bit of that back and forth of like, well, great, we're doing all the work and somebody else is reaping the benefits. So I get the balancing of like the institution of maps and things like that, right? I mean, there's a certain point. A lot of that has to come from the customer base too. They, and I, again, I am blessed. I mean, I got some really awesome people in the store that get it. I mean, they support it. They, they know they can go on Amazon, get it for cheaper, you know, whatever. And I just talked about like, hey, I just restocked some things from Amazon because it was cheaper than what I could get from the distributor, right? Yeah. Um, the reality is they also get something else from the store. They get, if it's a community, if the, my shining personality, that'll be a, <laughs> anyways. Um, so it starts with them and then some help from the publisher, but also from us, because I mean, as retailers, sometimes we're the, our, we destroy our own environment, right? I mean, in crazy, crazy, why are you doing this? <laughs> you really, just literally, Go find a job at Walmart. It's going to pay you better than what you're doing right now. Why are you doing it? But living the dream is something that some people just don't want to give up. Um, or sometimes they maybe they have a trust fund and they just want a cool place to hang out. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, sure. Uh, I'm sure there's a certain number of people who just, you know, sign a lease agreement and throw up some tables. And, oh, yeah, I just wanted a place to, to be with my buds and play some yep. cards. Yep. Yeah, fine for you, I suppose. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Oh, oh legs going numb. <laughs> no. Uh, tariffs. Oh, okay. So, just a quick one on that. How yeah. they've actually impacted you specifically. So you, you talked about it, the tariffs with regards to China. Yeah. So the only so far direct impact, although I'm hearing it from, you know, some publishing friends and stuff like that, that their costs are going up. There's another one. UPS increase, and we'll talk about that in a minute too. But uh, so the only direct thing I've seen right off the bat right now, the the price of my concessions, my my uh, cans of, of pop, has gone considerably up. So we're probably going to have to create that crazy barrier, and people are going to yell at me because it's way too cheap, John. Our cans of Coke are seventy five cents, right? We're going to raise them to a dollar, I think, because it's just there's just no which. Perspectively, I mean, that's a, you know, it's a huge hike when you look at it, right? It doesn't make a lot of sense to do 90 cents. It's just easier to keep it to around the even amount. Uh, but we're, we're, we're feeling it there. Now, Wizards had lowered its, uh, its MSRP, uh, not its MSRP, its, its margin a while back. Mm -hmm. um, what's going to be interesting to see is actually next year, God, I forgot what they're talking about, like a 4% price increase on UPS. Um, so that I think is going to hit us pretty hard too, because I don't know quite exactly what all the tariffs are that impact the board gaming world. You said in Canada, there's one specifically against playing cards. Yeah, so I can only imagine magic. that's like, <laughs> uh, that obviously affects magic. Right. And yeah. yeah so thanks Trudeau. Yeah. So have the retailers in your area then gone above the suggested retail price? Because I know, I don't believe Wizards increased the price at all. It depends. Yeah. Ooh, I've seen a lot of variations. So some retailers are, uh, for a long time, like $4 a pack. Uh -huh. for a pack of Magic was pretty standard. Now you're looking at like four fifty dollars Again, mm -hmm. uh, for like a box of uh, Ultimate Masters. What was the MSRP for that? It was, it was a lot. Three but, something, yeah. It was a pretty good water cash because they're thirteen dollar packs. So, yeah, I've seen stores that were pushing it at like three fifty, so they were trying to like go lower. I've seen stores that were saying four fifty. There's like whatever, going right out to lunch. It's a super you know expensive set. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, limited run. You know, I don't care. <laughs> we're gonna try and make some money off of this. So it's a it's a variety, but for generally speaking, it's always been higher than. Uh, yeah, and we've. Um, 
We pretty much stuck to retail on all the master set. I mean, that some master set sold less, like slower. But at this point, I'm down to Masters 25, Ultimate, and uh, Iconic. Those are the three sets I have left in the store, and each one of them sold for the retail price. I didn't, you know. Yes, you're right. You're going to get your price on for sure. It's just, Eventually. So the reality with that kind of mechanism, it's what can you absorb, right? If you're struggling to make next month's rent, you're in a tough spot, man, because you can't be sitting on inventory. You need the cash to pay the, the landlord, and I get it. You're turning that product, but you also understand that you got to get out from under that, right? Because you set some expectation from your customer, I'll call it customers in quotation marks, where you're drawing the person is just interested in the cheapest possible price, right? And, and when you start raising the prices, because now you can afford a sit-on product a little bit longer, then you get pushback and you become the greedy merchant, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway. Yeah, it's yeah, always it's, easier to um, lower prices than it is to raise them. I have not seen quite the direct correlation with the exception of literally that one product uh, yet. Will it change? I'm sure. Uh, and I don't know how much longer this is going to go on. I mean, again, I listen to a lot of economy yeah. stuff. And, you know, it seems like here in the U.S., the farmers are the ones that have been hit the most because it's been tariffs on exported pork and stuff yeah. like that. You know, so, yeah. again... It's difficult because we like to think that I don't care. It's too bad that this guy lost his job. But the reality is it's such an interconnected economy that when one of my customers loses his job, I get less revenue from it, right? I mean, it's just kind of the way it is. And again, if we're back to the minimum wage, if costs go up, I'm going to see it on my end too, right? When I go out and I buy a burger or curtains or whatever, they're going to cost me more because the guy at McDonald's or the guy at Kohl's is getting paid more. Theoretically, that's how it's going to end up. I don't know if I'm going to be making more. <laughs> That's the question, right? Because all my revenue is sales. So. Well, you're the capitalist villain, so. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm in this because it's fun, but I'm in this because I want to pay my mortgage. I want to pay my car payment. You know, I mean, I. I yeah, you're survive. in for the money. There's nothing wrong with that. It seems to be prime sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think. If we had some publishers on, on here, they might be able to give you a better indication because they're going to see it and feel it first. Definitely. Yeah. You know. yeah. No, tariffs, the customs, like Canada's always had it kind of rough just because of the, between the tariffs now yeah. on playing cards, that kind of sucks for a lot of Canadian retailers, but also just, you know, our conversion ratio for Canadian to American dollars has been terrible for a long time. You know, we're, sure. you know it's not great for us when we're, we're paying a buck 33 for every dollar's worth of product right. coming over the border. That's pretty harsh. But uh, yeah, it's, it's just something, it's just the way the math works over here. That's what you gotta do. Sure. And it's, it's gonna, uh, don't get me wrong, and I probably shouldn't be saying this because I peddle this stuff, but let, let's put things in perspective. We are talking about luxury goods. I mean, these are items that at a certain point in time, I mean, for some people, maybe you gotta have your daily dose of magic packs on to open, I get it. but. Realistically speaking, we're not talking food here. We're not talking, you know, and those are... It's not fuel. Yeah, it's a considerably different matter. I mean, it sucks. As human beings, we need entertainment. We need, right, once we're fed, once we got a place to sleep, once we got maybe a loved one, or a, you need that sort of entertainment value, right? And then, yeah, we're, we're a little higher on that hierarchy of needs. than Yes. The very so, basic. so I, I literally, some people are like, oh, I have to have this. I'm like, no, you don't have you really want it. Yeah, you want it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I fall into that trap too. So. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah, actually, I remember having an argument with somebody. And I, I came up with the idea that I think our, as a society, we, do, we can't actually support airlines. Okay. And basically, I was saying that the idea of an airline wouldn't exist right now if it weren't heavily subsidized by everyone who's saying, we really want this to happen. Sure. And it's like just a technology as a thing. It's just if, if like fuel prices and technology and the labor and everything that involved and getting a plane up in the air and landing it somewhere else in the world was exactly what the market should say it would cost. I don't think people would be able to afford it. And it just wouldn't exist as an industry because you need a certain amount of people to flying constantly. Like flying one person in a, in a jumbo jet doesn't make any sense, right? You need to have like every plane needs to be full for the math to work for an airliner to exist. I think as a society, we're probably not actually there just because like 
you know, if magic is here, if hobby games is here and like foods here, airlines are like way up here, you know, high end technology, right? You need all the intervening layers to work. And I think we're not actually quite there other than the fact that people love the ability to travel. Sure. So we're willing to like sacrifice a lot at the bottom to make things, you know, make it a little bit unsteadier at the top. So it was just a kind of like a theory that I had that, that, that idea. No, but, but I'm going to go with you're right because I mean, when I look at like people, you know, it's like, Oh, we'll cut the military spending. I'm like, but you realize a lot of the things that we enjoy these days, like GPS and stuff like that do come from military based research. It's what's happening right now with the U S supposed space program, NASA, right? Mm -hmm. basically contracts out and goes, look, I need a rocket that does this and it needs to cost no more than this. And SpaceX and all these other companies compete to make it work in exchange for technology that they can then market and do stuff. That's theirs. They get to keep it, right? NASA gets to use it. They don't have to develop it. They don't have to, the taxpayer doesn't have to pay for it, right? But they're bringing on private sector parties to make it work. And you're right. That's, it's, the public good, basically, at the end of the story, that yeah. any one company doing it by themselves wouldn't work because it's just the amount of money and resources needed would never be returned in investment. So they don't. So in order to make it exactly. work, you need somebody on NASA that goes, okay, you build this, you build this, because we need those two things together, and they can, you you know, you can market that stuff, and then now there's a market for it. I think they were talking about, like, if you do space stations in space, it, that only makes sense if you have things that go to that space station, they need refueling to go somewhere else. If you don't have those all the infrastructure cars, at the same time. Right. And they like one together. wouldn't happen without the other already existing, so they just don't happen. Right. But if you're like, as a group, hey, let's go do this. And if you're in control of like, a, a, you know, trillions of dollars in taxpayer money, you can say, yeah, let's go do that. And then you just kind of take it, take it from one space and you put it over here and you make it happen. So like it's, I, I guess the like, the difference is, SpaceX is kind of proving that maybe, you know, rocket travel and like going into near earth orbit and stuff or low orbit, maybe that's actually kind of viable now as a market driven endeavor, right? Like it's not completely, uh, they are, you know, heavily government involved and all that other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There is a push for that. At least maybe there's something there, right? So maybe the whole airliner thing is like a bit of a stretch. Maybe we're almost no. there. I just think we're yeah. like a hundred percent. It would exist if we didn't, you know, kind of circumvent yeah. the, uh, the natural way yeah. of things. And move but it proves the, the dichotomy of things, right? You want cheap air travel, but you want all the luxuries. You don't want to pay for the carry-on bag. You don't want to pay for the extra leg room. You know, you just, you want those things, but you don't want to pay for them. And it's kind of like that minimum wage thing. You want an increase in minimum wage, but you yeah. don't want to pay more for a board game. I mean, I, I, well, we're human. We're human. Yeah. We want everything and we don't want to pay for it. We want infinite everything for the minimum Required effort. This is the way it works. Uh, <laughs> so we kind of touched on the oversaturation part mm -hmm. of the market. That was the final point after all of these, you know, little things kind of chipping away at the edifice of the specialty store. Oversaturation, we have a gluttony of good things and it's kind of bleeding. It's kind of leveling out the playing field. So nothing, like you said, nothing stands out too much. There's too much supply and just not enough demand. So, in, yeah, so if we're back to like, we, we failed at generating, our supply has outstripped the demand, right? So if we, we start with that sort of, whether it's true or not, right? Let's, let's assume it is, that it is true. What's happening is that, uh, you know, you as a publisher keep, keep putting out product, but the, the audience only have X amount of money, right? So unless either that audience member somehow increases, doubles his money, he's not going to buy more. That's his budget. So now you need to bring in more customers so you can sell more games. But the reality is, even then, there's so many choices. You get in this, like, which one is the right one? And people become a little more selective. Right? They start really kind of like, and that whole process, the impulse buy is sort of gone, right? Um, me as a retailer, is it real? Yeah, no, it's 100%. I, I, I'm horrible at it because I'm like, but this one's got like two gigabytes more, but this one's got a better fan. You know, I mean, I, I will sit there for hours sometimes. And what's funny about it is the more good, awesome choices you're presented with, when you finally do pick one, you actually feel bad about it. Yeah. Because you you start to regret all the other options you could have taken. It's actually it's terrible. The more options yeah. you pick, the more buyer's remorse you have. 
Yeah, I want to go. I, I just today I, I got new insurance for workman's comp, and that oh god, I uh, ha, ha, what a process! What a oh, does the old guys like? No, I can give you a better deal. Just come back. Oh god, horrible, horrible. I hate that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> but me as a retailer, uh, all right. So what were the numbers? Let me try to remember the numbers. If I remember correctly, a few years ago, it was an average of three board games released a day. Then we went to six. This year, it's 10. 10 board games a day. That's 300 board games on average a month. And I have to decide what to carry in my store. Yep. Now, there are some things that you put in together, and to me, they're no-brainers. Um, so without knowing what this is, but if I were to say, take the word Disney, add villainous on it, you would probably edge a bet that that might be making you some money, right? It's a game. Well, you get to play the bad guys, and you compete to be the biggest bad guy of all the Disney villains. I'm in. Yeah, sure. And I know I can sell a dozen to 24 copies of that game easy, right? I got a market for it. That's fine. But there's a lot of this other stuff that is, like, really good gameplay, really good. And you're like, nobody's noticing it. Like, I played it. I love this game. Why is nobody buying it? It's just too much. And it, it's lost in the noise. Uh, yeah. And so... The inversion of the curve, I don't know if they were quite there yet. I don't know if there's a catastrophic bubble explosion coming. I hope not. I, I certainly don't want to like say that that's what's happening or whatever. Not. There is a leveling. There's definitely a leveling. And like I said, overall, my store is up this year. I, mean, I want to say it's about it. So literally, I mean, I, I wish both channels were firing at 100%, um, you know, because I mean, even though online sales only account for about 20 to 25% of my annual sales, it's still a significant mm -hmm. portion, right? So, I mean, if both were firing, I'd be looking at like 25% to 30% growth this year, which is Fantastic. crazy. It's, just that I, it's crazy. So we're at 16 instead of, which I'll take it. I'm not, I don't want to whine about growth. But it's harder and harder for me to keep up. It feels like every time I turn, look at the shelf, and somebody goes, do you have this? I don't have that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And because it's literally, I have to make decisions. I can't do a restock order of fifty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand. You know, you can't. You yeah. gotta figure out what's your budget and what are you gonna spend this week, right? Um, and it feels like no matter what I pick, I pick the wrong choice because there's so many options. And when the customer comes in, you may have it, you may not. And I don't care how big your store. Currently, we're the largest store in Nevada, right? But I still can't stock it all. There's no way, right? Even if I went with just one copy of everything, and that's probably a bad strategy because really now is the time to look at what are your, your copies you're constantly running out of and those are the ones you go deep and everything else as much as it pains me because man this was a great game i had a great time playing it right when it, we did our show the first play i, I love playing that game i want to play it again reality is i'm probably never going to get back to it because i got another 10 games i need to try and put on our little youtube show right kind of situation and so that i can advise customers too so then you look at the ones that are selling for you and you just keep those deeper so you don't sell out of those and everything else needs to sort of take a, a real backseat. We're in a situation now where there's a lot of things that are, and I, I hate to do this, but it's like it's a one-time splash. You bring it in, once it sells out, that's it. You don't restock it, it just moves special order yeah. and it comes in once and, and, you know, and it's an increasing number of titles, uh, which is sad. Because I know a lot of these publishers, they bust their butt to put out good quality stuff. It just, you know, it's hard. <laughs> Survival of the fittest, kind of. Like, in, yeah. in some ways, you'd imagine like the strongest, the best, like, you know, on most well-designed game kind of rises to the top, generally speaking, but it's probably not actually the case. Most likely the most well-marketed game, the most colorful, yeah. you know, like something to make it stand out. And that's just, that's the winner this week. But uh, there is, there is definitely uh, something to be said about intellectual properties, right? And licensing yeah. and picking the right one. Uh, there are some things that don't necessarily make a lot of sense, but um, so like, for example, uh, God, I hate to pick on anyone in particular, but okay, let's uh, code two. We'll pick on two. Munchkin and code names, right? I mean, code names now is on this kind of like, it's code names by Harry Potter. It's code names, but this, like, it, correct. And Just I can sell like, that. I can, there, there's no question about it, but how much of that can I sell? It's still code names. Am I going to be able to convince somebody that's not a Harry Potter fan to go, there's a new code names out. Yeah, but I already got code names. It's 
Mm-hmm. I have no incentive to buy that one just because it's Harry Potter because I'm not a Harry Potter fan. Or if I am, do I want to spend money on this one oh. because it's Harry Potter? Am I going to throw my old copy on eBay and buy the Harry Potter one? I, you know, I, I'm struggling a little bit with that right now with Arkham Horror 3rd Edition, right? I, I played it. It's actually a good game. I don't like the board, so I'm like, Am I going to keep my old copy? Because now it's starting to go for money. Am I going to, you know, so at the end of the day, I also have a limited amount of space in my house. So. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that's one of the more interesting things about the question of uh, like capacity, right? As like a, say you are a hardcore board gamer. You buy them all the time. You love these things. You have closets full. How many can you possibly take, right? Not ten a day. Are, they're not like recycling them or moving them. Yeah. You know, they're not uh, like you said, putting them on eBay. Not really. They're just like I no. want to have more. But even those people get to the point where like I've got, I'm done. I got a library of, I got a wall of board games I don't need anymore. You know, like except for maybe one every once in a while. So even the best customers will eventually reach that point. Like at least with board games, right? Because they take up lots of space and yeah. you don't consume them the way that you do with like a booster pack or something like that. Yeah, but even magic cards, you get to a certain point where like, okay, I think I'm going to take these comments to the fire pit and burn them, right? I mean, because yeah. you get to a certain point where it's like, I don't need 15 copies of this card. I'm never going to need 50,000 50, commons that I'm never, ever, ever going to use. And what if you, you don't reach that point, your wife or your husband may reach it for you, right? I mean, you make it yeah. to the point where it's like, it's me or the highway, right? I mean, it's your, your, take your games and get them out of the house kind of situation. Yeah, it's, I don't know, like I said, I think some publishers are using a, look, let's let's put out as much as possible, we're going to find a hit in here somewhere, right, kind of situation. That's not the strategy. I, I would still focus on trying to find what I believe is my winners, getting 100% behind that, because that's the other problem I see, too. My new release shelves, right, so when we moved into locations, we finally did this new release section. So people were like, oh, don't you have a new release section? There's stuff that's in there for three days. And it works its way out because it gets pushed back, you know what I mean? Three days and it's not a new release anymore. Three whole days. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's insane. Yeah, so, it's yeah, it's too much. And we'll see where it goes. I am hoping for gradual leveling and sort of like, um, you know, people finding their groove. Look, we do really well these kind of games, right? We only put out a couple of titles a year, but they're solid, right? And they're, they're good titles that we put all our marketing behind, all our promotion behind, and some kind of joint effort on everybody's part to try to bring in new blood. That's, that's going to be key for us to continue this kind of growth. The other reality, too, is we've had crazy growth. Crazy, right? At some point in time, it's got the... It's got a plateau. Uh, there's At only so many people that. in your in your region, right? Like, so yeah. we'll see where it goes. I know that a lot of us on the buying end, because the other dichotomy too is that people don't understand. I was like, well, I sold out of my print run. Okay, you sold it to distribution, we then sold it to the retailer. And if all of us are sitting here on 500 copies of your games and we're using them as mattresses, ugh, that's not a success. You sold it. Yeah. The next time, though, I'm going to have to be very cautious about what I buy from your company because it's stuck here, right? And for certain, it's a long game, not a short-term win kind of thing. And and I don't want to bag on maps. I I believe in their their utility and stuff like that. Um, for I should have probably specified maps is minimum advertised price policy to where you basically, if you want to carry a product, you can't advertise it for less than a certain price. They're kind of like really big now. Um, they're also a hindrance because when you make a mistake, you can't recover from it. Does that make sense? It's more difficult. Well, if you overbuy and it ends up being a dud, you can't right. dump it. You can't get, Which you can't is part of the out. effect. But you're also sending a clear message, buyer beware. You better really want this game if you're going to order it, right? It cuts out a lot of speculators, which is a good thing. I mean, yeah. you should really be looking at your inventory, figure out your target audience before you go, I think this is going to be hot. Yeah. And see where it goes. But yeah. Yeah, I was thinking maybe the only possible solution might be, maybe, just uh, throwing it out there, would be for everyone to kind of find their equilibrium and pull back. Like you were saying that, you know, maybe go back to the three game average a day or whatever yeah. it was instead of the 10, right? Maybe that maybe that's the magic number for the market to work. And it might just be like something that, you know, maybe they don't all have like a big publisher's meeting and say, okay, guys, we're going to, 
we need to slow down the release schedule. We're killing each other for no reason. We're out here in the trenches, you know, just getting murdered. There's no reason for all of us to lose. Let's just all pull back, you know, like reduce our costs by not producing as much over and over and over again. Not, you know, all the design and all the elements of the games. Just release less and make the same amount of money because you have this gigantic audience that wants your games. Maybe there's just a... There's something a balancing in, in, act that they need to find. Yeah, and there's something in this industry. And don't get me wrong, I work with a lot of retailers. I work with a lot of publishers. There's some that get that common good, and some they're just like, "Ah, hey, I'm gonna go squash this guy." I mean, kind of situation. <laughs> I think you see it more at the retail level, okay? But that does happen at the publishing level, and definitely happens at the distribution level, right? So, um, well, I think the question would be like. Will if there's one rogue publisher, if everyone says, "Yeah, that's a great idea," let's let's pull back a little bit, and then the one guy's like, "No, no, I'm gonna double up and games, 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 and just I'm gonna be the only one putting games out." I I don't know if that's actually like a good strategy or a bad one, right? There'll be, I, I think it would remain to be seen whether or not they would actually be successful doing that. If they would yeah. squash the little guy in their mind and be like, "Oh, everyone's gonna." you know, walk away from all this opportunity. I'm going to take it. That's mine now. I'm going to take all this market share. Yeah. I don't know on the publishing level, because obviously I don't print games and I don't do stuff like that. I can tell you at the retailer level, I haven't seen it work. I've seen it as a, in general, it seems to be a faster way to go out of business. Kind of situation. Unless you're independently wealthy or privately funded, somebody, you know, like money is literally like you can, you're the Amazon of retailers and you can just dump money every day and nothing changes and you won't care. You know, so. Yeah. But in general, yeah, it's, there are uphill battles that you better not engage with. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to do it. So. Yeah. All right. So let's just like, let's wrap up some of these solutions. Let's, let's okay. summarize, you know, maybe what somebody could take away from all of this uh, somewhat doomish and gloomish stuff. And, you know, there's not a lot of great things like the industry is growing. Stores yeah. are doing well, despite all of these problems like the 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 hobby the the crowd that is interested in what we're offering is growing there's more interest that's great so maybe we just need to prepare a little bit better for some of these things so we, we mentioned uh, diversifying you know if magic's your one and only uh, revenue source maybe you need to start the uh, looking elsewhere and spreading some things away <laughs> getting away from wizards don't abandon it uh, wholesale but you know there's no there's no if you're doing well with it and you but i think this is a good strategy whether magic is up or down having something else to fall back on is always a good idea so as long as you're doing it well and not at the detriment of what you're, you're good at right because that's what some people get lost in so. yeah yeah if you can uh hopefully build a portfolio of product offerings that kind of balance each other out so that when one's up one's down and one's down one's up you, then you end up kind of, you know, just steady, happy growth. That's kind of the ideal, right? So second point, cut your expenses. Like, you know, all these things we're basically talking about, most of these involve some sort of, you know, reduce on your margin, right? So if you're losing 4% here and then 5% here and your things are just starting to squeeze you out, the one thing that's kind of what everyone should always be doing, you know, like it's something that seems so obvious that you should just reduce your expenses. What are you doing? What's your problem? Just pay less money and then you'll be fine. But that's probably what you should do. You should probably try and figure out a way to cut costs because every dollar you cut is a dollar back in your pocket, right? Making a dollar is not actually a dollar that goes to your bottom line. But if you can cut your expenses, that's uh, one way to potentially save yourself in the, the near future. 100%. And the first thing you want to look at is the frivolous expenses, right? I mean, did you really need to go to dinner? Was it a business dinner? Is it supposed to be on the, right? Do the employees need a pizza party this month? Maybe. Did they do a good job? Did they not do a good job? So no pizza party. Right? I mean, I'm trying to be mean, but people don't understand. It all builds up. When they go, oh, you know, it's only 25 cents extra to buy ink here versus there. But if you're going through three cartridges a month, that's 75 cents. It's all stuff that builds up, and you'd be surprised. Um, you know, yeah. don't, don't put stuff on your credit card. Try to save up the money and okay. do it directly. You know, interest. Don't pay interest. 19, 20% interest. That's, 
that's a killer. <laughs> that is not good stuff, right? Yeah, that'll run away. So, yeah, and learn to leave within your means. It's it's speculation is a horrible, horrible thing. But that, that, that's probably coming up. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, it, it, it could be other things too, just like savings on shipping, on, on combining orders properly and like figuring out how to optimize that kind of thing. And, you know, that could end up adding a couple thousand bucks at the end of the year, but that's just a couple thousand bucks is your profit margin, right? Like that and, matters, and right? About Talking how, multiple orders. Talked about how horrible the, the workman's comp, uh, whatchamacallit process was, but it's half of what I was paying and it's, thousands so you know i'd rather have it in my pocket <laughs> exactly that's something that's money that you can do something with so like every dollar that you save is basically another dollar on your profit or absolute profit so that's one of the more important things to look at we mentioned building better relationships with your distributors you know if you want to get those good rates you have to be a good customer and you know start now start today and then the last one that, again, you know, I think we should talk about it anyways, but uh, economies of scale, right? Wow. So this was, <laughs> it's not uh, necessarily easy to achieve, but if you can do it, it's a good way to, again, kind of like reduce your expenses and, and run a little bit. Sure. Uh, and I think some people are misguided in, in the impression that everybody pays the same price. And some people are misguided into thinking that like, if I can get enough volume, I'm going to make a killer because somebody's going to offer me a better deal. That's true to a certain degree. Most of the distributors have a tiered system. You give them this much money in a year, they'll give you this much discount. You give them this much more money, they'll give you this discount. Okay? But it's not this like incredible swing that people think like, oh, John, because I've had this before. I've literally walked up to a customer with my invoice and going, I understand you want the box for $72 or 75 I paid 72 for that box. I'm not giving you a two for 75 Well, John, that's because you don't order enough. <laughs> <All right. laughs> that, that quite isn't the case because there are ceilings and ceilings but yes if you can achieve some economy of scale in the sense of like you really have volume in certain areas you in general will be better off it is difficult to achieve and it takes time and patience that's what a lot of people don't understand right don't go in and go i'm going to write a check for somebody for fifty thousand dollars because he's going to give me this price and that fifty thousand dollars worth of product is a lifetime supply because that's not an economy of scale next month when the distributor comes back to you and goes hey dude where's your order and you go well you got fifty thousand dollars worth of stuff i haven't sold you're going to be back to square one right because i mean yeah. it's a consistent kind of thing it's, it's a long-term process of uh, building yeah the relationship yeah but that goes back to that when you when you look at differentiating your store right you want to make sure you're not taking away from your primary thing if you're a singles heavy store and you're doing thousands of dollars a month in singles that involves a certain amount of time and resources, sorting them, pricing them, putting them on TCG player, eBay, whatever, all this other stuff that you're doing. When you start diversifying, you're going to take a certain amount of resources and take it away from that. And you might lose that economy of scale that you had because you were buying singles by the bucket. And then you went, well, now I'm doing FBA on these days, so I can't buy singles on these days, right? I'm like, I'm doing one or the other. Yep. You gotta watch out how you're doing it. And again, slow and steady is the reality of it. I mean, it took me 25 years to get to where I am with certain things. Um, you know, I, I order directly from publishers in certain cases because it is not so much a better deal, but I can get what I want. That's another economy of scale that people don't yeah. think about. When you can afford to order three cases of a product, you have a pretty good assumption it's going to sell out in Christmas time. You can have it. Somebody else won't because they can only buy them two at a time, right? And then they're gone. So maybe not a better price, but a higher return on investment because you're able to invest more and get a bigger return. You get into speculation there, so you gotta watch out for that too. You can make a wrong day. I, I would never gamble my store's livelihood on that, but I can go, I can afford to lose $5,000, 10, 1,000, 100, whatever it is. You make that gamble knowing full well, if it goes away, you're not dead, right? Yeah, don't gamble with money you can't lose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't have much else to say about economy of scale. It's it's just a slow process. It really takes a while, and it's important to focus on the things that you're good at because you're you're gonna get that return. Everything else is just throwing darts in the dark in the dark and hoping they stick somewhere. So yeah, and I think that brings us to that last point we were talking about it before. Just you know, don't be the guy. Don't be the store that competes on price. Don't. That is, it's not something that will set you apart. All that does is 
pretty much guarantee that you're going to be a miserable person until you shut your shop down because you're going to be working for free to try and, you know, cut your margins down to zero just for the next person to open up the shop down the street. Yeah. Cutting you out of it. And don't get me wrong. There's a lot of love there. People will love you, love you to death. They'll pat you on the shoulder all day long when you're cutting yeah, your deal. As you're locking up your door and you're putting yep. your keys in the mailbox and they'll still be like, man, you were great. So if that's what you're in. I had, uh, I had, I'm going to close with this one. It's a bit. Hi. All right. Well, so we had this year, locally, we had two competitors shut down, but one of the, one of the two competitors customer came to me. It's like, you just heard so-and-so is closing down. I was like, yeah, it kind of sucks. It's a tough business. You know, it's like, yeah, it sucks, man. I love going there. His prices were always so cheap. And I just, I just, ah, right. The consumer doesn't necessarily get that. So do the, what's best for your business so you can be there for your true friends that are coming to your store and supporting your store and all that good stuff. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to be friends with everybody. I think that's probably one of the, the bigger lessons in this whole thing is, right, you do not want to make all your customers happy. Some of your customers want you to, to sell everything for nothing. They want to get as much out of you as possible. And you don't want to make those people happy because they're not really your customers. Customers are somebody who, you know, are there to build your business with you. It's a beneficial relationship. You're providing value. They're getting what they want. Right. Those are the people that you're trying to make happy, not the ones who are shopping around and trying to get the, the lowest price. And they don't really care about the hobby or your livelihood or anyone else at the shop or anything else. Right. Yeah. And I, I don't even begrudge those people. I don't have animosity against them. I just know I can't build my business around them because I, I can't. Yeah, I'm not it's, saying like kick them out of the shop. No, know? no, no. Unless they're a nuisance or disrupted the business, then I have no alternative. That's literally sure. when I have to draw the line. Yeah, get those people out of there for sure. Because then they're making everyone else's day worse. But the person yeah. who's just like, oh, and man, I, I, I would buy this if it were 20% cheaper. And you're like, no, no, I'm not going to do that for you. Sorry. No reason for me to lose money for you to be happy. But, yeah, you know, don't do the race to the bottom thing. Anything else you want to throw in here? Any, like, I don't party? know. I mean, and I, I just want to be emphasized because I don't want to end this on a gloom thing. In general, like my business is up. I know a lot of businesses are, a lot of fellow retailers. Um, some publishers are up, some publishers are down. Um, you got to understand, like with anything like the housing market, the economy, there's ups and downs, right? In general, it's been a positive year. Uh, there's a lot of change. There's a constant in the world that's changed, right? And you got to learn to adapt with it. But it's nothing that's extinction level. You cut the board game industry is not going out of business tomorrow, right? Magic is not going to die tomorrow, even though they're doing this push for esports and all that good stuff. I think both will survive, and we discussed this in previous episodes, right? There's a space for both of them. Without a doubt, Wizards wants to push that model because I think they're not good at it, so they're trying to do better with it. I mean, they, you know, you play Hearthstone, right? And you, you were putting it on a higher scale. You didn't, you felt that Magic, the way it was, was boring. Magic Online kind of situation, right? So, but uh, look, it's not as bad as it sounds. It's just that, yeah, some caution is advisable. Just like people are talking about the economy here in the United States, all we're heading for a recession is like general trend seems to be, in general, it's good. We should always be cautious. You should never, yeah. ooh, my life savings in the stock market. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, so. anyway, that's where I want to end it, I think, on a, on a, it's not doom and gloom. It's just, yeah, we're seeing a bit of a leveling off. And I think that's actually healthy. Um, it, 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 ideally, the result is better publisher, better games, right? And, and more titles you actually want to own and buy and play and play again. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a good way to end it. You know, the industry, like you said, board games, bigger than ever. Magic, still pretty much bigger than ever, right? But yeah. it's not, it hasn't started shrinking yet. It's just the growth has started to slow down and there's some obstacles that, you know, we need to figure out in the next year or two. So that's, uh, I think, a good place to shut it down. Sounds good for me. We will uh, we'll see you guys in the next episode of the Manaverse Podcast. Uh, thanks for coming on and talk to you later. All right. Have a good day, guys. Bye. Night, what's left? I don't mind. <laughs>